Welcome everyone to what is self-care in 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. What we're going to cover today is we are going to cover self-care as self-awareness. And I know this is a really different way of kind of thinking about it, but um, self-care is not a bubble bath. So I will just ruin it right now for you. Uh, we're also going to discuss this, the role of stress in our lives. We're going to talk about how the brain kind of blocks us. And then we're going to talk about the parasympathetic state. And hopefully by the end, you will have created your own self-care practice. That is my hope. So start out by just thinking about what do you already know? What do you already know about self-care? What are you thinking about around self-care? And what do you want to know? What, what do you hope that this topic covers? And if for some reason this talk doesn't answer the questions that you're wondering about, make sure you take my email down, send me an email, and let me know what you would like for me to cover around self-care. So here's the answer before the talk. So just in case you're one of those folks who want to know the answer first. So here's the answer. The answer is we actually need to create a self-care practice. We need our own daily practice every day, every day. So you can do your practice in the morning. You can do your practice at night. You can do your practice during lunch. But basically, we need a practice. We need to commit. We can't just think about self-care. We actually have to do self-care. So self-care is 10 to 15 minutes. It's not a long time. It's not 35. It's not two hours. It is literally 10 to 15 minutes to restore and relax and bring us back into our real true selves. So I hope you can borrow some of my ideas and make them into your own. So again, here's what the difference of definition. Self-care is self-awareness. That's weird. So self-care is something that we are dramatically not doing right now. We are lacking this ability to do self-care. It's not a bubble bath. It is not a video game. No offense to Animal Crossing. I know a lot of people are playing that right now. It's not online shopping. It is not going out to eat. All of these are fine. These are fine activities. They're great distractions, but it is not self-care. Um, these are basically distraction techniques. And they're great to use during hard times like now, but it's not self-care. Self-care is much harder, which is why we don't do it. And self-care is grounding. It's personal growth. It's noticing when I'm triggered. So let's take a really quick self-care inventory. So in your mental mind or uh, on a piece of paper next to your computer, just kind of check off, like, are you doing good self-care? So this is a list of good self-care. So let's go through it. Do you take two full days off where you don't do school, you don't do work, and you relax? Like, we have a weekend for that. Do you use your weekend or do you work straight through it? Do you think, oh, good, this is time for my side hustle? If so, you're probably not doing good self-care. Do you take time every day to read or express gratitude or meditate or pray? Are you coming home every day and being gentle and soft and kind to yourself? Do you do something every day that's fun? Do you stretch or move every day for 15 or 20 minutes? Again, you don't need hours. We just need 15 minutes. How often do you eat real food without chemicals? Like I'm not talking fast food. I'm talking like something from a garden. How often do you do that? Do you get at least seven to eight hours of sleep? A lot of us are going off of five right now. That's not enough sleep. Some people even need nine. Are you listening to your body? Are you slowing down when you feel sick or tired or when you're just maxed out? Do you just, do you listen to what your body's telling you? Do you share how you're feeling with one person every day? Do you have a buddy or a friend or a best friend or a partner who you can come home and say, this is my day. I just experienced this weird thing. We need that person. That's self-care. Do you have something creative or expressive in your life to motivate you and inspire you? Do you stand up for yourself and say no and put in your boundaries when you need to? Do you have meaning or purpose or spirituality or something much greater than yourself in this moment in your life? I encourage you to do that and find that. And if you don't know what that means, like, what does that mean, spirituality? We're going to talk about it a little bit later, but it also means go ask people. Ask people, what's your practice? What do you do that's spirituality? Do you take regular vacations? Like, you're allotted so many vacation days. Do you take them or do you work right through? Do you take breaks every day? 
Are you kind to yourself? And do you let go of mistakes at the end of the day? Do you say, I did the very best job I could do and I'm letting it go? Or do you beat yourself up in the night, sleeping and telling yourself all these terrible stories? Do you manage conflict well? Or do you blow up or let it simmer and fester and then it just sits in your belly? Do you let it go at the end of the day? Do you avoid using alcohol, smoking, or other drugs to calm down? I mean, no judgment here. There's a lot of people doing all of those things. But I guess what I would say is that is not self-care. Like medicating yourself to calm down is not self-care. And so I know it's common right now. I mean, they just took a survey of folks at my work and, you know, adults are doing day drinking. I get it, but it's not self-care. Do you engage in regular self-inquiry or examination to see how you're moving through life? How am I doing this thing called sheltering in place? And then last but not least, are you the person that you want to be? Do you wake up every day and say, man, I'm so glad I'm me. I do cool things. I am awesome. Do we do that or do we kind of have some looking at? Do we have to look at some things here. So self-care is self-awareness. I want you to know that. Self-care is kindness to self. And it's not letting the voice in your head beat you up. It's noticing, where am I numb? Where am I shut down in my life? And self-awareness looks like getting therapy. It looks like getting your finances in order. It looks like, what are my weaknesses? What are my challenges? It looks like celebrating our strengths. You know, if we have a Mother's Day or a birthday that got forgotten, maybe we make a big deal out of that for ourselves. We celebrate ourselves. That's self-care. Um, maybe we understand our triggers. What sends you over the edge? Self-care is stress management. So we are going to talk at the end of this little bit about stress because stress management burn, you know, is very important. We will get burnt out or we will get sick if we don't take care of our stress. And then self-care is also being a witness to yourself. So you get a journal or you have a therapist or a friend who you reflect back. It's the ability to sort and kind of talk about what's going on right now. These are really difficult times and we need to sort. And self-care is about surrounding ourselves with people who open our hearts and make us expand versus those people who shut us down and make us feel small. So take a, a slight inventory in your mind of the people in your world. Are there people in your world who make you get quiet and small? Or are there people in your world that help open you up, give you fire, make you feel like you're your best self? You wanna surround yourself by those people. That's self-care. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's okay. You don't have to have any idea what I'm talking about. I made a journal. It's 30 days of being more self-aware. So I will send that to you uh, via email. So make sure you get my email, jsimon at arizona.edu. So you can always email me at jsimon at arizona.edu and I will send you a journal. It's 30 days of being more self-aware. But self-care is also stress management. So let's talk about stress and how it gets in the way of your self-care. So self-care is boundaries. We need an, a hard stop in our day. We need to make a psychological break between work and life. And right now we're working at home, we're living at home, we're being at home. There is no hard break. It's all mushing together. We get up and we work all day and we're still taking emails at nine o'clock at night. That is not self-care. That is not good boundaries. We need a hard break when we leave school and when we leave work. We need a ritual, like a cut. So we want to make sure that we're being aware of sneaky moments, like when people say, how was your day? Well, when people ask that, they're being nice, but then you tell them about your day and now you're back in your day. So that's a sneaky moment. Um, texting with your coworkers. You need to cut the cord. When your day is over, it is over. Do not talk about work. I mean, you can call your coworkers and talk about your kids or whatever, but you want to cut the cord about those sneaky things about bringing that stress in about work. When you leave for the day, make a list. I promise you that list will be there tomorrow. Just make a list. These are the things that I didn't get done. It's okay. I'm going to go to bed and just leave these on these lists. Move physically and then get into your heart. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So how do you break up the day? Do you turn your laptop off? Do you turn on another computer? Do you move your desk around? Do you move into a different part of your house? Do you change clothes? Do you do yoga? Do you take a shower? 
Do you watch a movie? How do you let go of your day? Maybe your ritual is you take the dog for a walk. Maybe that's your way. Maybe you cook and you listen to music. But make sure there's a really clear break where you're not sneaking back and answering emails. You are literally cutting the day. That is self-care, 100%. We also want a journey out of our head into our heart. Like while we're working and while we're at school, we're like super mental. Like we're like up here in our brains and we need to leave that super mental and we need to drop into our hearts. We need to switch that off. And so how do we do that? How do I go about when I make that hard break, that boundary, how do I do that? Well, you move your attention to your heart and this is kind of an interesting concept, but you're gonna breathe in the back of your heart. Uh, this uh, particular exercise is from Wendy De Rosa. She's great. She's an energy person, and she talks about breathing in and out through your heart. That's kind of new to us. We kind of think about breathing in and out through our lungs. But you basically lean back in your chair and see if you can feel the back of your heart. Feel the back of your shoulders. And see if you can sense your back heart, the back of your heart. Take a few seconds and breathe in and then hold it and then let it go. And when you breathe out, breathe out for a little bit longer than you breathed in. And then you breath, then you took a breath in. Boy, that was a terrible grammar. So it's up to you to kind of move your attention. It's up to you to kind of stop the day and get soft and move into our heart. There's another activity we can do with our heart. This is coherence, it's through the heart math people and it's called heart breathing. And basically they've done a lot of research and they talk about gratitude as being the only types of thoughts that don't excite us. Gratitude kind of keeps us in a calm, still place. So they tell us to take a few seconds, focus on your heart, focus your attention on the center of your chest and your heart. You can put your hands on your heart if that helps. It actually does help, it soothes you a little bit. See if you can feel your heart beating. Feel all of the sensations in your chest and pretend that your breath is flowing in and out of this heart center. And then think about someone you love. Think about a pleasurable activity or something that you appreciate or something that makes you feel really happy. Even me talking about it, I like a smile comes onto my face. That's great. That's what we want. Think about somebody who you love, who you cherish. You may have to pull out a picture so that you can really see them. And imagine that you're breathing in and out of your heart and you're breathing in and out love for this person or this experience or this activity. And again, if we just took a few minutes, like three minutes, to kind of let go of our day and do some heart breathing where we're kind of thinking about someone we love, boy, that would really make our world better, wouldn't it? So let's look at why we're stressed. Some of you have followed me before. You know that I kind of cover this, and so this might be review, but it's always good to remind ourselves. So right now we have three parts of our brain that we are moving in and out of. We have the reptilian brain, we have the mammalian brain, and we have the cortex, the frontal lobe. And we are moving throughout these three parts of our brain all day long. And basically the back of our neck, where our head connects with our neck, you can feel it, there's like a dent there. And that's where the reptilian brain sits. And the reptilian brain is responsible for breath, heartbeat, our nervous system, living, surviving, sex, all of those things. And then on top of that reptile brain, we have a mammalian brain. The mammalian brain is where the amygdala sits, a little pink button in the center of our brain. And that's our limbic system. That's where the emotions live. That's where memory is and feelings and we cry a lot. And in these two particular areas of our brain, we use different language. So when we're in this reptilian brain in the back, we are using fear-based language. We are talking about things like, I hate this. I feel like I'm in prison. I feel like my civil liberties are being violated by wearing a mask. I feel angry that I'm stuck inside. It's a fear-based language. When we're in the mammalian brain, that middle brain, it's all emotions. We are constantly talking about uh, my feelings. I feel so sad. I feel so hurt. I feel so frustrated. I feel so angry. This is really where our brain is. We're in that kind of feeling state. So kind of notice, how often do you make kind of angry fear-based statements or sad fear-based statements versus like this kind of feeling place where you're kind of 
overwhelmed with emotions, notice, because you're probably moving in and out of those two brains a lot. And then the type of brain that we're not using right now is our cortex, our frontal lobe. This brain is offline. It's shut down. And the reason why it's shut down right now is because most of us are living in our reptile brain. Most of us are in fear right now. And so when we're in that reptile brain, this frontal lobe is not working. So the frontal lobe, the cortex is used for decision making and inventions and math and creativity and reasoning. So hopefully when we're at work or we're driving or maybe when we're like at school, we're using this part of our brain. But we really think that we spend a lot of time up here in the cortex, but we really don't. And to be honest, this part of our brain is not even done developing until we're like 26. So some of us, especially those of us in college, um, we, we haven't even reached that place where this frontal lobe is completely formed. So basically we're reacting a lot out of the reptile. In addition to that, we have this autonomic nervous system that runs from the back of our head all the way to our tailbone. And this is designed to get us out of danger fast. So there's two particular states that we're gonna talk about. One is the sympathetic state. This is us all day long running full blast, like a car, uphill, towing a trailer, burning ourselves out, burning candles at both ends. This is stress and tension and fight, flight, freeze and worry and ah, this is us. This is us all day long. And then there's the parasympathetic state. The parasympathetic state is us when we are sleeping. That's where we really wanna be. We wanna be a little bit more into that parasympathetic state. We can also float in a pool. We can also meditate. We need to drop down into that system. So fear basically is controlling us right now. One part of our brain is emotional and one part of our brain is fear-based and that's pretty much where we are right now. We're worried about the future, we're, we're trying to figure things out, we're trying to get our kids through school, we're trying to figure out our finances. So basically we have this nervous system that kicks in. So not only are we back in the reptile brain, but our nervous system is kicked in and it's basically telling our system, you are in danger, you are in danger. And so as a result, we are not thinking. Our autonomic nervous system kicks in and now we're in survival and we are in fear. In fact, when we start thinking about a problem, even thinking like, how long am I gonna be doing homeschool? Now, at that moment, the minute you just ask that question, boop, your brain's offline. You're not even thinking. And basically your fear response takes over. It starts with this reptile brain. The reptile brain says, I am in danger. It tells the amygdala, this little pink P in the middle of our head, I am in danger. And then guess what? This part goes offline. We are no longer thinking. So the amygdala's job is to shut down this frontal cortex so that we can move. So see that little deer running? He's like, get me out of here. That's exactly what's happening in our brain. We are not thinking. We are supposed to be escaping. So think after you're safe. So the reptile brain triggers the amygdala. The amygdala says, whoop, shut down, and now we're offline. So a lion chasing us feels the exact same as a yelling student, a flat tire, uh, not having enough money to pay our bills. All of this is fear. All of this is that reptile brain triggering the amygdala, turning off our frontal lobe, all of it. And basically what happens is, this frontal lobe does not communicate with the reptile brain. The reptile brain does not communicate with the frontal lobe. There's no communication. It's all through this amygdala in the center of our head. And basically we can't think our way through this. When we're triggered, when we're in fear, we cannot reason or logic our way through. We have to soothe ourselves to get out of danger. So positive thinking is not going to be enough. Like I know there's a lot of folks out there that put post-it notes on their mirror and say, today is gonna be a great day. I am thin, I have a million dollars. All that is beautiful. But when we're triggered and we're in fear, that is not going to cut it. So when we are distracting ourselves with Animal Crossing or shopping online or listening to our breathing, that also may not do it. So. I actually even wanna say, let's say we kind of are a beginning meditator. If we're focusing on our breathing and I'm in a fear-based response, I actually might be triggering myself all over again because when I'm listening to my breath, I might think, oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack right now. My breath is moving so fast, what's happening? So again, if I'm in a fear-based place, 
the best step is not to go meditate. The best step is not to go play Animal Crossing. We actually have to soothe ourselves. We actually have to calm down our brain, which then calms down our heart rate, which then soothes our blood pressure. We need to get that reptile to go to sleep. Go to sleep. So this is much bigger than distraction. I mean, distraction works. I'm not dogging it, but we need to soothe. So if I can't calm down, if that reptile's in charge and I can't calm down, I can't get this brain to turn on, I'm not functioning very well. I'm foggy. I, I'm like, why did I come into this room? What was I doing? Wait, what was I supposed to be doing? So again, this is normal. I wanna normalize this for you. There's no dysfunction. You're not mentally ill. You have no diagnosis. You, there's nothing wrong. This is 100% normal, but basically I'm not functioning. So in order for me to function, I have three favorite things that will stop. One is to take a nap. It is very important that we get enough sleep. The nervous system is completely reset in sleep. So take a little nap, 15 to 20 minutes. We all need sleep. Take a nap, it'll reset you. Floating in a pool. If you're lucky enough to float in a pool and have a pool, yes, go float in a pool. Because what stressed out bear is gonna be floating in a pool? No one. So it's great, you can float in a pool, it will reset you and you will feel totally calm again. Um, and then if all else fails, uh, it's the scuba mask in water trick. So you get a big bowl, like a big salad bowl, like the size of your head. You fill it up with ice water and ice and you stick your whole face in the bowl and make sure that you cover your eyes and your nose, like where you would have a scuba mask on. And you stick your whole face in the water and you hold it for like, I don't know, four or five seconds, six se seconds. And you take a breath and you hold it and then you come up and then you take a breath. And then you go back down and you put your face back in the water and you do this like five to six times and you do this so that you calm down like five or six times. And again, your nervous system will reset. It's called the diving response. So isn't that exciting? Another way we can do this to stop the adrenaline flood is that we can use breathing. Now, this is a bit tricky because some of us who have trauma, this is not our way. This is just not our way. So you just go la 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 during this part because you won't listen to this. But if, if you can do it, close your eyes because our eyes create high stimulation. We get about 80% of our stimulation through the eyes. So if you can close your eyes, do it. Great. If you can't because you're in fear and if you close your eyes, you're going to be triggered, then don't. But then once you close your eyes, you're gonna lengthen the exhale. So we're gonna breathe in for four, we're gonna hold for two, and we're gonna breathe out for seven. Super easy, four, two, seven. So here we go. Let's breathe in for four. And hold it for two. And then breathe out for seven. Great, perfect, you did it. So if you did that five to seven times, you would soothe your nervous system. Again, this is not meditation because you're kind of counting. You're giving your brain something else to kind of focus on while you're flooding. The next thing to think about is that we do not want a stress build mountain that then crashes at the end of the night or we have to use a bottle of wine to calm ourselves down. We do not want that stress building, 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 noon, one o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock, 10 o'clock. We want to make sure that we kind of stop the stress mountain build. So basically we want to calm down. We want to build and then calm and then build and then calm and then build and then calm. So doctors, heart math, they're all recommending about three minutes, three times a day, taking baby breaks in your day, again, I am not saying an hour, I'm not saying 30 minutes, I'm not even saying 20 minutes, I'm saying three, three minutes. So how long is three minutes? Like the length of a song, like a, like a song is about two and a half minutes long. So you put on a beautiful song that's slow and soft, don't listen to big drums because your brain won't relax. So we want something soothing and calm, maybe like dolphins or birds or, you know, soft music. And so we would take a break for three minutes. So the minute we get off that Zoom call and we're like, ah, go take a three minute break. Or the minute we leave the grocery store and we're like, oh my goodness, I'm so triggered. Okay, listen to a song for three minutes. Close your eyes and listen to a song for three minutes. So the goal is not that we keep building, 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 and then we, then we have to use alcohol or drugs or wine to 
calm us down. The goal is that we take little baby breaks in our day. When we do this, when we're sleeping, when we're floating in a pool, when we're doing meditation, when we're listening to calm music, when we're doing deep breathing, all of that is going to reduce the thoughts, we're going to reduce blood pressure, we're going to reduce the heart rate, and we're going to calm ourselves down. So that is my script for you, not to do a big 20-hour meditation moment, but literally take little breaks in your day. I also love this activity. I'm really excited to share this with you. This came from the work of Tree Franklin. She basically tells you to shift your emotion in four steps. And I really like it and I think it works. So try it and then send me an email if you don't like it. Uh, or if you love it, send me an email because I, I like it a lot. So basically you start with where you are. I don't want you to do any bypassing. If you're stressed out, if you're angry, if you're sad, be angry, be sad, be in that place. And so just acknowledge it. I am angry and say it like four times. I am angry. I am angry. Be there, right? And then we flip it and then we say, I feel anger. So now I'm not angry. I'm just feeling angry. So I'm, I feel anger. I feel anger. Say that about four times. And then you move it to, I feel energy. And I like this one because all emotions are just energy. So now I feel energy. And actually when I say that, I feel kind of bouncy. I feel energy. And then we take it one step further and say, I feel. So imagine moving from I am angry to I feel anger to I feel energy to I feel. Like I can just feel that separation and it's so beautiful and I love it and I hope you do too. I hope that helps. Okay. The next step is to get out of our heads. We spend so much time trying to think about, rationalize, analyze, explore, wonder, blah, 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 blah. It's too much. So we need to really move out of our head. And how we do that is we do creative things, we do movement things, we do music things, uh, we do uh, going outside and watching a sunset, calling someone we love, dancing, writing a note, a thank you note, uh, making music, coloring with crayons, anything that kind of gets you out of your head. Again, these are just like ideas, but anything that kind of soothes you and kind of pulls you out of this mental trying to figure everything out. What if it's just like, okay, that we don't figure things out? I like this activity. I've been doing it for years. It's one of my very favorite ones. And so I thought I would share it with you. It is called nostril awareness. <clears throat> and um, basically what you need to know is that our nostrils change dominance every 90 minutes. So every 90 minutes, one of our nose holes is breathing in more air than the other nose hole. And so just take a few seconds and focus on which one of your nostrils right now is more dominant. I'm going to take a drink while you're doing that. So the way you can feel it is you kind of are right here, like where your glasses sit on your face. Notice which one of your nose holes is more dominant, which one is breathing in more air. And it doesn't matter if you have a stuffed up nose or you're sick, it's okay. Your nostrils are still doing this. So my nostril that's most dominant right now is the right one. So once you kind of figure that out, then flip it. So now make the other side more dominant. And you do this without your fingers, without doing any fancy anything. You don't have to do any yogic, yogic breath or prana breathing. You just focus. This one's a little bit more tricky because you really have to focus and make the other one breathe in more air. This is really good to do when you're in a meeting and you don't want to listen to what's happening or you are waiting in line or you at our doctor's office or you're nervous about something. Just take a few seconds and focus on your nose. Remember your mouth is quiet. Your mouth is closed. You're thinking about your nose and air. You're slowing your breathing down. You're focusing on which one of your nostrils is more dominant, and then you're making the other one more dominant. And then if you have more time, make the other one more dominant again. Flip it. I do this in meetings. This is a really great tool. However, if they call on you, you won't know the answer because you are focusing on your nose. So that's a tip from Jenny. All right. 
walking and counting forms. I love this. This is from the work of Harry Palmer. Uh, I, de I developed this a long time ago when I started working at St. Mary's uh, psych unit. And basically the concept is if you're panicking, if you're spinning out of control, you are flooding and you do not want to flood. You want to get up and walk. And I know you actually don't want to get up and walk. When you're having a panic attack, the world feels like it's coming in on you, but you actually have to make yourself get up and walk. So if you're having a really bad day and you're losing it, this is your technique. This is the technique for you. So it's called walking and counting forms. And all you do is you take a walk and you count shapes or forms, any kind of form. Do the phone, do the doorknob, do the door, do the ceiling tile, do the carpet, uh, do the glass on the counter. The best thing is to get outside. If you can get outside and walk and count forms, awesome. But you don't have to. I used to do this in the hospital. I used to walk down the hallway. If you're at a workplace, you can take a bathroom break and just do this on your way to the bathroom. This is to kind of stop that flooding feeling of like, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm feeling angry. I used to use this with my court appointed clients who were guilty of road rage. I would say, pull the car over and walk and count forms. It only should take you about 60 seconds. So 60 countings, 60 forms. So you get out, you walk around, you see a shape, you count it. One, two, three, four. You don't have to do it out loud. You can totally do it in your head. You count to about 60. Now, if your stress starts coming back up, that's okay. Just get out and walk and count forms again. It should probably only take you about a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes at the most to calm down. So imagine how you could kind of shorten your freaking out time. If you're panicking, if you're sad, if you're beating yourself up, if you're having angry moments, again, get out, walk, nature is good. So being outside is helpful and count shapes. The only way that this will not work is if you're just walking and counting. If you're just like one, two, three, then that won't work. So make sure you see the item, you see it, and then you count it. Okay, other three minute practices, yoga, walking meditations, progressive muscle relaxation. I love that one. If you tell your body to calm down, it doesn't. It doesn't like you. It doesn't want to tell you to calm. It'll just like stress out. If you walk around and your shoulders are up at your ears and you're like, calm down, I got to calm down. You, it won't work. So what you have to do is you have to kind of trick it. You have to be bigger. You have to clench that part of your body. So if your shoulders are really up high, clench it tighter and even tighter and tighter all the way up to your ears and then drop. And so systematic muscle relaxation is the same way. You either start with your toes and you work up or you start with the top of your head and you work down and you clench all your muscles. Like if you were starting at your face, you clench all your face muscles really, really tight, clench them up like a little mouse as tight as possible and then let it go. And then clench your shoulders really, really, really tight and then let them go. And then chench your chest really, really tight. I do this at night before I go to bed. I let go of the day and I do this and it's great. Do go all the way down to your toes. Google it. It's very, this is a great activity. Write down thank yous. Uh, when we are in gratitude, then we are in love. So do that. That'll calm you down. Music and singing, that's always good. It raises our antibodies. It changes our vibration in our body. I try to incorporate humming or singing into almost everything I do. I love that. That's so great. There's a million mindfulness apps out there, so I'm not endorsing any of these. I don't get paid or whatever for any of them, but uh, there are a million out there. I really like Insight Timer because it's free and I like it. Um, also, I found one recently called Liberate Meditation, and it's an app, and it was designed for people of color by people of color, and there's lots of really great things on there like how to help get over microaggressions. How, I mean, really, it's so um, applicable to today and what we're going through. It's, it's a really great app. So that's the last one on this list called Liberate Meditation. Very, very good. You might have another one that you use like Calm or something like that. They're all really great. I would say if you are not a yogi and you don't practice meditation, you probably want to use a guided visualization. That's a voice that's kind of guiding you through kind of a process you start there because if you just start with like hardcore zen 
meditation, your brain is going to be like, oh, great, silence. Let me tell you all the things that I was thinking about today and I was worried about. So I wouldn't recommend starting like a really austere Zen meditation practice right now. I would kind of use a helper, use like a voice on one of these apps. So again, the easiest way is guided visualization, which is what I was just talking about. You don't have to try, it's very easy. You just find a voice that you like, right? So you could Google it right now on YouTube or any of those apps. And basically you just find something like a guided visualization for sleep, a guided visualization for stress response. Some of them are long, they're 35 minutes. Some of them are five minutes. Pick out something that you like and that you, you feel relaxed when you're listening to that voice. Because some of them, maybe the voice is irritating or maybe there's background noise that you don't like, like music or twinkling birds or something. And you're like, oh no, that's not for me. But that's really the easiest way. That's three minutes of calm right there. Just super easy. You just put it on your headphones and zone out. Um, if you say to me, Jenny, I don't do visualization. Okay, that's fine. But honestly, visualization really isn't complex. I mean, if I ask you right now, how many windows do you have in your living room? All of you thought about how many windows you had in your living room. That's visualization. So it's not hard and um, you don't have to be perfect and nobody's grading you. So I would definitely try it. And then last but not least, what is your practice? What are you going to do? How are you going to take all of this information that I just gave you and how are you going to put it all together? Are you going to light candles or put out an offering? Are you going to walk along a path and smell the air? Are you going to take up a meditation practice? Are you going to pick a guided relaxation? Are you going to journal? How are you going to add in that 10 to 15 minutes in the morning or at night to kind of let the day go and kind of come back home, come back to ourselves? You ultimately have the choice to let in beauty and truth and goodness. You can do that. You can do it. All right, and then I always say this, but I'm gonna say it again. I think we can always go deeper. I think spirituality is the return home. And I know when I say spirituality, a lot of people go like this, but I want you to know that spirituality is not religion. Spirituality is the study of the mystery of life. And there's so much mystery right now. Our world is full of mystery. And so what if we embrace the sacred mystery? Because it is so much more interesting than our reptile brain. Like the mystery, the divinity, like why I do the things I do. I, I think, why do we have a dream life? What do I dream about? All of that, all of that great spirituality is so much, so much more interesting and so much more worth my time than worrying. Um, if spirituality isn't your cup of tea, then find your purpose or your true self. Um, maybe you connect with your wiser, older, best self. We all have one. There, it's all in us. So just take a few minutes and, and maybe journal to from you know maybe us 30 years from now or us 10 years from now. What's our older, better, wiser self telling us about how to behave right now? Mentor ourselves. I also think it's kind of fun to write down the things that you're really good at or the contributions that you've given to the world. We kind of, in our homes doing our own kind of thing, we kind of forget like how we have done really great things and how we've contributed. So remind yourself, we're gonna get out of this. We're not stuck here forever. And also if you feel small, cause you've been in a really tight place where you're kind of stuck in place, get big. Be a starfish in the middle of the floor. Be, do snow angels on your carpet. Like get big if you're kind of feeling small in a cramped space. And then write down your things for the future. I know it feels like we're stuck in here and we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but the truth is that we will get out of here. There will be a future. And so we can plan a trip, design a wedding, write the next great American novel. Like we absolutely can plan for the future. And I know that seems kind of, counterintuitive right now, but we can. So last but not least, keep taking time for yourself until you are you again. So thank you so much for meeting with me today and spending this time with me. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email and I look forward to reading all of your thoughts uh, and ideas. Take care and hopefully I'll hear from you soon.